Have you been seeing a lot of medical experts all over your TV? What if I told you we could have a medical expert and an entrepreneur, kind of a medical entrepreneur or a physician entrepreneur that worked in the tech industry, right? Tech is the future. Let's just face it. We're doing remote doctor visits now. You can get your cannabis license remotely. You can do just about anything remotely. I have an amazing guest today talking about how we're going to be able to live longer by using state-of-the-art technology because so many doctors, when they're done practicing, are now going into the tech field. We're going to find out this and more coming up next. <laughs> This is to the point. I don't know why we started adding the point in, but that's what we're doing today. I've uh, got a good show for you today. Have you heard the term physician entrepreneur? It's a cool world that we're moving into where technology is becoming a bigger part of our world, where VR, virtual reality, and AR, augmented reality, is now being combined with AI, artificial intelligence. Hey, I'm here to break down all the captions for you and breaking down what they all mean because I recently learned them myself, so don't. Don't judge like, wow, he's wicked smart. No, I'm not wicked smart. I just happened to look that up before we came on air, and I now know. So now I share my knowledge with you. Thank you. That's what we're, that's what we're here for. I'm here to help you. You're here to help me. That's why, we, that's why we work so well together. We read each other's minds. Thank you. Good show for you today. Interesting guest. I'm going to jump into this and learn a little bit about how the medical world is changing the way that we can envision a doctor's visit as we try to become more contactless. That's what we're going to learn about today. So let's get to the point with today's guest. Welcome to the show, Dave. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? You know, it's another day in paradise, they say, or the summer. Uh, as, I, as we record this, it's raining outside my window, so it doesn't feel so summery right now. But, it's uh, beautiful and sunny here in Orange County. Uh, I miss Orange County. I love Southern California. You know, that marine in me has to be like, oh, I miss it there. It's beautiful all the time. Nobody believes me that it's beautiful. Everybody doesn't believe the hype about it's the beauty true. of Southern California. It is. I, I'll vouch for you. Good. Good. I, I'm good that you'll do that. So let's hop into this. So you aren't, so we'll be clear. We're going to talk about medical side of the house in tech. You are not a doctor. I just want to make sure we're, I like to, I like right. to start that out just so everybody knows we're not going to, don't go on a search like the two of us are talking about. We're going to use words like physicians and doctors. Neither one of us are. So no. Not, do not follow our medical advice. Don't, I know a few. Yeah. But yeah. I know doctors, but I would not trust me. Don't have me doing surgery because that'll be no. Bad. I faint when I see blood, so I'm me neither. Your guy. Uh, the smell too. You yeah, know. And I'm not a fan of that either. So, <laughs> you, <laughs> you've got years of experience, over 30 as an advisor, you know, and an inventor yourself. Obviously, the tech side of the house is your cup of tea. We've seen drastic changes in everything, uh, from sports in the VR side of the house, artificial intelligence, and then COVID came in 2020, and we already started seeing these physicians being able to go online and start diagnosing you virtually, yeah. which is fascinating. And my, is. my experience was getting my cannabis card in California through a virtual doctor. True story. Uh, <laughs> awesome experience. He just popped on. He's like, how are you? I'm like, I have PTSD and I served. There you go. Huh? There you go. That's how you do it. But it was a cool experience to meet a legitimate doctor and do it that way. And then obviously COVID came around. So you've been an innovator in this field, in the medical field for over 30 years. What drove you to start working within this industry? When I was in college, uh, the week of my sister's wedding, my grandfather had an ischemic stroke. Um, he had a surgery called the carotid endotorectomy to remove plaque from his, his arteries in his neck. And one of those pieces of plaque uh, flowed north and occluded his middle cerebral artery, which resulted in an ischemic stroke. And uh, I went to go visit him. 
and I met the neurologist during um, when he was caring for him, and he said, hey, there's nothing I can do for him. I understand you're studying engineering. Uh, maybe you can use that degree to develop some type of product that would help a patient that I may have in the future. So I did. I, that, that, that struck with me. I was either going to go into um, the automotive industry or in healthcare. Uh, I had an interview with Saturn Cars, and no one has a Saturn car anymore. Those are gone, <laughs> right? So it's a good thing I went into healthcare. And uh, after graduation, I went to go work for a catheter company that made angioplasty catheters. Those are balloon catheters that would use to inflate the plaque or move the plaque against the wall of an artery in the heart. Versus having what's called cabbage, coronary artery bypass grafting, where they would take a vein from your leg and go across the occlusion in your heart. That was my first exposure to catheters. And uh, I thought, hey, maybe this could be used in the brain someday. But I ended up getting another job at Boston Scientific. I met an older Chinese scientist that kept telling me stroke is the future. Get involved in, in stroke treatment. And in 97, I co-founded a company that was making embolization quills to treat brain aneurysms, which is hemorrhagic stroke. Later on, 10 years later, I co-founded a company to actually remove the blood clot from the arteries in the brain. That would have helped my grandfather years earlier in 89. So it took a long time to get there. But uh, yeah, I, I developed catheter-based technologies in a field called interventional radiology. So catheters, guide wires, stents, seclusion coils. That's all I know. Sweet. And I'm not a doctor. No, it's, it's all amazing. I'm over here like, I got to start Googling more stuff. I'm like, <laughs> Google away, Google away. Uh, you know, so you picked radio, so you ended up in radiology because obviously you're the general partner of the Quantum Fund, OC. Right. I love that. It just, sounds, yeah. it just sounds fancy that you're in Orange County. I think you all have to do that. I think all businesses in Orange County throw OC <laughs> into there just so you know that they're cooler than the rest of us because it just sounds cool. It feels cool. It just it feels cool to say it. I mean, I feel I feel I should go surf right now just because. <laughs> and I have a six-foot stick down in the garage that I can go get. It's, unfortunately, it's set for Hawaiian waves, not for California, oh. but... <laughs> you know, close enough. Uh, so what, you know, what, you know, why radiology? Why did you end up in radiology after all those other, okay, I'm not a doctor, so all of it sounded really ridiculously smart. I wasn't trying to mimic Trump. It just came out that way. <laughs> ridiculously smart. Uh, I, I comprehend better than the rest. I tr promise I'm trying to stay away. You started talking about strokes. I'm like, this is very topical in politics right now, too. I swear I hear more about strokes than anything else. He may have one. Uh, or I may by reading his tweets. One of the two is right. going to happen. Uh, but why did you end up landing in, like, radiology, which seems like a very, you know, focus on the radiology market. Seems really interesting and, and of the times. But why did you end up in that? Yeah, when I was in college in the late 80s, uh, I was told that the new therapies coming down the road would be called less invasive and less invasive uh, therapy uses catheters. And that market uh, is in radiology. So uh, I just stayed in that field, uh, making catheters. So a catheter would enter your body either through a hole in your wrist called, called the radial artery or through a hole in your groin called the femoral artery. And those are the kind of the two key points that, a, that an interventional radiologists would use to enter into the body to treat a brain aneurysm, to treat stroke, to deploy a stent into the heart. Um, so that's the radiology field. And they use uh, uh, CT scanners. They use MR scanners. They use uh, 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 DSA, which is digital subtraction and geography. Those are all tools that the radiologist would use to either diagnose or use that during the intervention. So. I work in radiology, That's uh, and I stay in that lane where yeah. I'm not going to develop a COVID-19 vaccine. So if we talk about that, I, you know, oh, that's good. Well, I'll, I'll give you a referral. Good. Yeah, I know. The, the My Pillow guy, he's creating one by himself. So we could just, <laughs> we'll go ask him. Because it makes sense that the Pillow guy would create a vaccine. Not you, who not actually me. works in the medical world, the Pillow guy. We'll trust him. That's where I'm going. That and the doctor who believes that aliens are reptiles or people are reptiles. Mm. I don't know. Those seem like trustworthy sources that I'm going to get my information from. Okay. Sorry. I can't help it. It's just too easy sometimes to do this. So, you know, the term physician entrepreneur, and that's why I stated at the beginning, you're not a doctor. I'm not a doctor. But the term has been around the last couple of years. Obviously, yeah. the beauty of tech is that we're get, it's good to see tech get into the medical field. And I know I had... Right. And when I say we dipped our toe in the pool, I'm talking about electronic signature. I remember when that started coming in and we started talking about HIPAA. This is way yep. back in the day, and I've told oh, this yeah. story. 
Uh, I remember talking to some big medical schools on the phone, and they were like, and I remember it's a frank conversation. They were like, Eric, nobody will adapt electronic signature. You're dreaming. This is like, you're a snake oil salesman. And I'm like, and then I laugh now in 2020. That's the only thing I ever sign is electronic. And I'm like, I use DocuSign three times today. Yeah, I, I, we love Doc. I mean, I shouldn't say this, but I'm an Echo Signer that uses DocuSign. But Echo Sign doesn't exist anymore. It's an Adobe product. So nice. I love you, Adobe, but DocuSign does a much better job with the product that we invented a long time ago. Don't tell them I said that. Oh, they'll watch this and I'll know. So it doesn't uh, matter. But as we get into that, what have you seen? I, I think that's what I really like. You know, it's taken storm over the last few years. Why do you see that? I mean, this. Let's. Talk, we're not going to bring COVID into it. We'll get to COVID and how it's changed. But what drove that? Like, what was the calling? I mean, obviously we. All of a sudden, going to the doctor became like a bad thing. Like, we need to stay at home more. And pre-COVID was kind of weird. You'd be like, why would I go see a doctor? from home online, online yeah. when I can go to his office, his or her, hers office. Now as a veteran, <laughs> I wish the VA did this because then people actually see a doctor, uh, but that's a whole nother subject on another matter that we we'll just won't bring up on my show. But I mean, why do you see that, you know, taking over and taking storm? What's the po- it, it was already becoming popular pre COVID-19. Now in COVID-19, it's the rage. Everybody's talking about it. You see it on the nightly news discussed at least once a week about people being able to reach out to their doctors this way. So, I mean, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Is this, are we ready for it is my biggest question. We are, uh, it is a good thing. Uh, it's much more efficient. Uh, a physician can see more patients um, in, in, in one day through uh, the camera, through the computer. Um, in, in our field, it's called t- telestroke. So the physician could actually diagnose a patient who's having a stroke by having a camera in front of them. So wow. they could look at their at their eye gaze, they could look at the droop on their face. Uh, so telestroke has been in my business for at least a decade. Um, but as we we generate more data, um, that data can be used. You know, you know, artificial intelligence. You know, then it was virtual reality. Now we have what's called augmented reality. So the more data you have and you put it to use, the computer gets smarter. And either uh, diagnosing a certain disease, which could lead to a physician understanding, should I treat or not treat a patient? Um, it's much safer. So it's, it even goes beyond just having a Zoom camera and having a physician visit. But it is real and it's very efficient and it's safe. I love that. that, that I mean, that's good to know because I, I think a lot of people are either leery on it. I, and I think that comes, I think that's something tech has to, will always fight. I think mm-hmm. a lot of people mix the data that comes out when they look at their social media compared to secure sites for doctors. There's a lot more requirements on that. Obviously your insurance money's going to that. It's not a, yeah. you know, a lot of people want to compare that to Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, all those crazy devices. And it's not the same right. thing you're, you're doing that. So what have you seen? And let's talk a little bit about COVID because obviously COVID's made a difference and an impact. What have you seen during quarantine that has sped this process up? Because you're talking about it more. Obviously, you've known about it for a while and have been using it, but doctors weren't using it all the time. Now, it's something that they're actually leaning on. Now, I mean, what else have you seen? Like, doctors, are they more willing to do this instead of sitting inside their hospitals? Do they want to? Are they accepting it? That's my biggest thing. Well, since March, uh, I've probably seen 100 webinars. (laughs) Um, and, and, the, and the physicians who give them are probably getting a little uh, wary and tired of them, but they know they can reach more people. I, I was just on a conference, uh, a virtual conference a week and a half ago called the SNIS, which is the Society of Neurointerventional Surgery. That's a key society in my field in radiology. And rather than traveling there and attending the conference by airplane, getting a hotel, having uh, dinners and so forth, maybe three or 400 people would actually attend it. It's a, it's a small conference. There were probably 25,000 people from around the world participated. So by virtue of having this you know, terrible pandemic, we are now able to reach many people around the world through uh, virtual conferences. Now, I still enjoy doing things in person, but to tell you the truth, I don't like getting on airplanes and flying from here to Paris, getting jet lag and staying in a hotel and trying to stay away and going to dinner. It's very tiring. It's very expensive. And... And sometimes you don't even get to see the presentation you wanted to see. So having this uh, today is, is, is really allowing you to experience more, learn more, become more educated. 
and then the physician can use that same technology to educate a, a potential patient. Or a patient could go online and see a conference virtually and learn, hey, maybe that's the therapy that I'm going to have. Yeah. Or so it's 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 really a good thing. Yeah. So let me ask you this, and this just comes from a patient standpoint. Now, if you go to your doctor, is this something you can ask them for? I mean, if you have a relative going through this, is this something you should be? I mean, how does it get to the general public, right, to see more of this? Because obviously this is fascinating to me, but it's the first I've heard of it. I've seen some of this other stuff. Like I said, I got my cannabis card through going online, which was amazing. I, I did that before using the phone, too, so it was pretty cool, too. But to see it this way, it, it seems like a whole new world. And obviously strokes are a big part. Uh, we, we see a lot of those going on and diagnosing those long as you don't trust a guy with orange hair who can diagnose them without even, you know, he could do it off video. So I don't even know why we need this. We got it. Just diagnose it from seeing things on TV. Uh, but I mean, how, how do patients go about kind of requesting this concept? Is there a way to do that? Or is this something we have to let the medical field kind of roll it out and then we get to be parried to it? The majority of patients are pretty savvy as it is. Um, in, in the past 15 years, since the internet has really exploded, and you got you know uh, uh, broadband, if a if a patient has a diagnosis, they go right to Google, and they start searching brain aneurysm, ischemic stroke, cancer. Um, so they come to the physician sometimes and say, hey, "I know I have this aneurysm. I, I heard about this company, Stryker or Johnson and Johnson. Are, are you going to use their products?" Right. So the patients are already finding what type of therapy they may be getting. They're already finding a physician that may be in the journals. Uh, you know, so we underestimate how savvy our own, uh, our own people are. Yeah. So they're go going to find these, these types of conferences. They may find the physician who may be treating them was, was cited in 116 publications, gave a presentation at some stroke conference. So then they'll, then they'll go to the doctor and ask him, well, where can I find more? So. Yeah. The patients already know where, where to actually find this information. They know what questions to ask the doctor in most cases. If, if you're elderly, you might not, or their uh, children will. Yeah. So this internet is such a powerful tool. And now that we have this pandemic and you can't travel, you can't go outside, everyone's on their computer, iPad, iPhone. You know? um, there's so much data out there. And that's, a, that's the flip side of this. There is a lot of data out there. And to the layperson, you really have to go see a physician and try to have them explain to you what you have and why they want to treat you this way or why they don't want to treat you or why they may want to refer you. Absolutely. There's so much data out there. I, I love that. that. I mean, that's good to know because there's people are researching. So let me ask you this loaded question. What's next? Like, where do we go from here? What else can, I mean, where does radiology go from here? Obviously, strokes are important. They're happening more as we live longer. You know, we see people trying, you know, the one thing I will say about COVID-19, I've seen more people outside getting fit and focused on that. I mean, if right. you remember back in November and everyone who watches my show is going to laugh because I probably say this at least once a week on the show. But if you remember in November, a certain company got destroyed for an ad they put out called Peloton. And now look at Peloton months later. They're the ones laughing and chuckling all the way to the bank. I'm proud to own two Peloton devices in my home. We love them. It's a great system. They're in back order now. I can't get one for four months. Right? It's crazy. <laughs> I mean, but think about it. November, they were like, oh, my God, horrible. And it's like August. No, you don't get one till Christmas because that's yeah. when they come out. I mean, and they are great. They're, they're, they're fantastic. So what's the future? I mean, obviously, we're getting healthy and fit. So people are going to go to the doctors. But strokes, as we have our older uh, neurology, you know, those kind of issues are coming up and families aren't i mean to me it seems like this will include the family so if your mother i'll pick on just my made-up family i'll just make up people right now uh if my mom goes to the doctors with my dad and there's a there's a brain issue and we want to be involved as the children i see this as being something where we could ask questions the doctor can have this conversation and we'll understand or he can look and go okay you're having a stroke number one that's fascinating that a doctor can look I mean, I understand the president of the United States could do the same thing, but he's done it. He's done it. He knows. I mean, he knows everything. The My pillow guy has a cure for COVID too, so we're good. Everything's solved in this call. But I mean, do you see that? Where do we go from here? Is kind of my question. When you look at it from a tech medical side of the field, or how AI, a AI is the future. I, I touched on it briefly earlier. Augmented reality is coming into surgery radiology right now. There's uh, companies that are developing technology 
that <clears throat> is using the data from imaging, either a computer tomography scanner or a MR scanner or a DSA. It's capturing all that data, and you won't even have to look at an image intensifier or a, or a DSA and be exposed to radiation inside the angio suite. You'll be looking at a computer screen like I'm looking at you. There will be sensors on, on the catheter, on the devices, that the physician can see inside the body. This is already happening. And robotics is also utilizing data like this. There's a, there was a company that was acquired a year ago by a major imaging company where the physician doesn't have to be in the room to treat the patient. A lab tech will load up the catheters inside the patient. The physician sits in another room with a joystick and can guide the catheter through the patient and do the therapy. So. And this patient could conceivably do this from across town with the patient inside the hospital. So robotics coupled with artificial intelligence using augmented reality is the future of radiology, of surgery. It's, it's happening right now. T Ten years from now, that's the way it's going to be. That it's is, coming that fast. That's crazy. I mean, if you think about it, I, and it, it just blows me away, so I'm just going to have my fascination moment here with you for a second. <laughs> I mean, if you think about the last three decades, where we've come. I mean, it seems to me just, I remember, I, I'm aging myself, but I remember in the 80s, we were all fascinated by watching Miami Vice and Don Johnson with his brick cell phone, right? <laughs> remember when my pops got one and put that, was carrying it around a little bag and he had the car right. that had the plug in. And yeah. now I'm like walking around and we talked to a uh, scientist with NASA and he gave me the craziest stat. And he said, hold up your phone, Eric. And I said, okay. He goes, by the way, do you know in your hand is four times more powerful than the computers that they had that took up rooms at Cape, yeah. Cape, at Cape Canaveral and in Houston when we put men on the moon. That's unreal, right? That's crazy. So then to see it go into the medical world, it's fascinating because we all, as we get older, as our relatives get older, we want them to get the best treatment. But now COVID-19 presents this whole new world where we have to be more hands off. And I think we're just going to be that way. And, and I'll ask you that just, in, in, obviously you're not a doctor, but I, I liked your I, insight into this. Basically, we're probably never going to go back to being as touchy-feely as we used to be no. in the medical world because we're going to finally match what our friends in Asia have been doing. I mean, when I've traveled to Asia, they've been rocking masks and less contact for a very long time. It's not something new. I know in America. Right. And we laughed at them. Yeah. We're like, ah, I'm not going to wear my mask on a plane. I don't know why Delta banned me because you're not wearing a mask. Duh. I don't care if you killed bin Laden or not, you got to wear a mask. Uh, true statement that somebody got banned from Delta and they thought they were some celebrity and they're like, we don't uh, care. Uh, you're not protecting COVID from you. You're protecting all of us from COVID. That's how exactly. Works. So do you think that's where the future is more hands off and pushing towards this other way? It is. However, it took this, unfortunately, to help us understand how much more efficient we can be. Um, we still need to socialize. That's, that's, that's part of being human. However, I, I probably have seven or eight Zoom meetings a day. I'm so much more efficient. Uh, yeah, I still see people for coffee or for lunch, and you know, we, 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 you know, we sit in less crowded restaurants. Yeah. That's how it's going to be today. But there's, the benefit is we're so much more efficient. We can get more things done. Our travel and expenses are lower. So you can put those dollars to work to actually create value rather than, you know, kind of wasteful T&E, as we all know. We've all lived in that business world. So we've, we've got to look at that and, and just understand efficiency. It's value creation. Uh, those dolls are going to go to something that's going to be more creative now. And, and I think that's hard for people to under, uh, understand. And I also think it's going to create more entrepreneurialism. Uh, you'll see people, you know, I can start a company. I can solve a problem and create a better service, a better product. At least that's what I hope. Yeah. And that, that's what's going to be in the book that I'm having published this December. I'm, I'm trying to teach people how to bring an idea to market through, through the medical device industry, create more entrepreneurs, you know, yeah. job creation. And, you know. I, I like, let's talk about that for a second because I heard you had a book coming out. So let's talk about that for a minute. It's interesting, right? Because I have a Silicon Valley background. So taking things to market is a beautiful, it's a great topic. And I like talking about it. Obviously, our show is built around entrepreneurship. So I, we right. air into the C-suite network for a reason. So it makes sense <coughs> that we talk about this just for a couple minutes. So bringing this, so what do you think the holdup is to get into medical, right? Like medical seems to be a wide open market and I have consulted, I've worked around, I have friends that sit in this 
And it's funny how this industry isn't as quick to market as others. And, and I'll pick on SaaS as one of my favorites. Obviously, software as a service has changed the world as we know it, and it's yep. growing still. Like, if you would have told me a decade ago, today we'd still be talking about SaaS growing and people still, okay, still in 2020 when I say things go in the cloud, I still have people who look up and I'm like, <laughs> wrong cloud. Seriously, you need to be told the cloud or, what, or how to use the cloud? What is, what is Google Drive or Dropbox or Box or any one of those things? And I'm like- There's so many of them there. there there's so many, but I remember, I remember those were the three I've always been part of. Yeah. I mean, why do you think the medical, for entrepreneurs jumping into medical isn't, I see so many jumping into SaaS. Obviously mm -hmm. SaaS is a little bit easier, but why do you think this, it's so hard to get entrepreneurs to point towards medical, which we're always going to need? And is 2020 the wake up call and I'm, I'm calling out COVID, is, is that the reason that's gonna push so many there with your book? Kind of give us what your book's gonna cover and then I'd love your ideas or thoughts on entrepreneurs that cause them to kind of go towards medical because we need it. We need these bright young minds that are out there. I mean, I Gen, Gen Z to me, and we interview a lot, I look at these Gen Z guys and gals and I'm amazed. They're, they've had these devices in their hands. They, right. they pick up, on, I mean, I have Gen Zers in my house. I sound old when I say that, but I do. <laughs> And, and I'm amazed how quickly they pick up on things that it would take the rest of us pick up a physical book and go years to school. Mm -hmm. And these folks are just creating without even, it's amazing what they create. So how do we get more yeah. entrepreneurs into the medical field? Well, I'll, I'll touch briefly on what my, my book is about. It, it's about how you bring an idea to market in the medical device industry. You know, you, you, know, you have an idea, you, you know, there's a problem needs to be solved. You have an idea to create the solution. You file a patent. You uh, initiate your capital contributions. You can build your own prototypes. You, you write a pitch deck to raise real money. You, you form a team. Uh, you go through your whole design development process. Then you go through the regulatory process, and that's kind of what I want to touch on a little bit later. You get it approved. You, you do your limited market release. You scale it. You get acquired. And then you hit the reset button. It's the regulatory process that I believe may scare some people away. Healthcare is highly regulated. And to bring a device to market, you have to do testing to show that it actually does what you say it does. It has to be safe. It has to be biocompatible. It can't be toxic. It has to be sterile. It has to be able to be implanted inside the body you know, sometime for life. Or, or So you have to do all this testing, submit it to the FDA, and actually you know, kind of counterpunch with the FDA and, and explain to them why it does this, how it does that. The same thing in Europe. You have uh, CE Mark. CE Mark, you see this on your uh, cell phone or, or, or any product. It's also on a medical device. The same thing for Japan. You go through the Shonen process. The same thing in China, the CFDA. It's a highly regulated industry for good reason. And, and that's just medical devices. To get a drug approved, to get a vaccine approved, you have to do clinical trials. And it could take years and years and years. The COVID vaccines that they're working on right now, they have to go through phase one, two, and three. Phase one, it's only on like uh, five or ten people. Okay, yeah. does it kill them? <laughs> no. <laughs> phase, phase two, let's do a broader range of people. Let's vary the doses to see if it works, if it makes you sick, because we already know no, it doesn't kill you. Phase three, thousands and thousands and thousands. That could take years sometimes. They're fast-tracking the COVID vaccine over the course of, say, six to nine months. Any other year, it would take five years to get something like that approved and millions and millions of dollars. So sometimes investors don't have the patience for that. Yeah. They're like, oh gosh, I have to make an investment now and not get a return for five years, maybe seven or eight years, I'm out. So it's a highly regulated industry. If you're after around a clinical trial, it takes years and years and years to get a return. So I think that's the key reason, but you know, you're providing something that's, that's doing a good service. You're making people better. Um, you know, I don't do this for, for the money. I do it for the love. I love developing products and bringing them to the marketplace. And when you have that as your motivation, then you win. You, you, know, you just can't be looking for a quick hit, and that's not how MedTech is. Yeah. It's not a quick hit at all. I, I love that you said that because that's, that's true, and it's, it's good. But, I mean, that caused another question in my head for you. Uh, now, now you say that, so 2020, <clears throat> COVID really ha probably has investors now more willing to take that five-year risk for the turnaround because you're seeing obviously if this vaccine is true now i, I just want to stress with everybody phase three means absolutely 
phase three can be a, a miss. I mean, I've worked enough yeah. in the medical field. It could be a big fat swing and a miss. It doesn't matter how much money you throw at it. And uh, I mean, wishes and butterflies mean nothing in phase three. It, it's great. Yeah. We're hoping. I mean, trust me, I'm just like everybody else. I hope we get a vaccine that doesn't cause, you know, <clears throat> third arms and skulls to grow out of our face you know right that's why i won't trust the Ru- I, I won't trust the russian vaccine because i'm like that was pretty fast that was way too fast they're like hey we went to a 7-eleven we came up with this try it you go first take two of these and call me in the morning you want me to trust you to do that but you just had your your president's number one opponent get poisoned and sit in a coma i don't know about that i'm good i i I'll wait for mine. I'll take my chances here in America. At least we have regulation. I, I'm happy it's taking this long, and it's fast right. for taking this long. I mean, the fact, like you said, get a vaccine within a year is almost impossible. Which, Rocket speed. Yeah. I mean, it's it just doesn't happen. I mean, it, oh. it, there's a lot of dangers that go in with this. It's like trying to put, you know, that adage I've heard in 2020 that makes me cringe. Oh, we're going to build it as it's going down the runway. I don't know if I like that idea. I mean... <laughs> I haven't heard that. I like that. Yeah, I, I, I keep hearing it, but I but then I go back to my Echo Sign days, and I remember our CTO. I love him. He said, "It's good. Our products are always eighty percent. We're always eighty percent good to go. Another twenty, we'll get it there." And it, I remember going and going sales team. That's what you have. And I remember as the marketing guy going, "How the hell are we supposed to sell this when it's eighty percent done?" That was the, we'll get the other twenty percent in the next ninety days. I'll put my best man on it. I'll put, yeah, and it's usually him, right? And he's like, I have to go golf. I'll be back. Uh, right. Silicon Valley way. But, I mean, so I'm hoping, and hopefully you, you know, agree with me here, that investors are going to be, VCs are going to be more willing to invest in brands and take some more calculated risk that they wouldn't do pre-COVID in this medical phase as we become more VR, a, uh, you know, VR and AR regulated, especially AI. You're right. AI is changing the way it's done and we've seen it, it we've seen it in the sports world especially in the sports world you know it's just going to be interesting i think medical now more than ever even for us to do simple things is going to have to take over it just i mean you're seeing it even with the 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 scanners that they have the body scanners for temperatures that you're seeing yeah. in some buildings uh, I traveled recently to a third, you know, to Mexico, a third world country. I'm so I'm sorry, Mexico. I just treated you like crap. Third world country, Mexico. Mexico was like, that white boy's never allowed back in. Uh, we'll remember him. But we walked by full body scanners, things that you don't yeah. see here. And then I look and it's, you know, Siemens had it. And that was like shocking. All right. An amazing German company. But they're German. Yeah. You know. They're on top of everything. You know, they, they, they are. A striker too. I mean, you listed Paris. I was like, there's a reason all those companies are there. Yeah, uh, they know what they're doing and they build darn good technology. So do you see that? I'll answer my uh, do you see the the VCs in taking more calculated calculated risk now because they see 2020 how it is or are they still kind of gun shy? Uh, the VCs have always looked for big deals. Um, you know, the VCs swing for the fences. They want to put a lot of money to work. Yeah. You know, in in med tech and medical devices and catheters, sometimes they can't put enough money to work to satisfy them. Uh, so out of say ten deals, you know, they're swinging for the fences on every deal. Which I think, to answer your question, yes, I I do agree that investors are going to look at healthcare and make more and more investments. But there has to be a lot of money being uh, in, invested. Where if, if I mean, if it's going to take five million dollars to get something to market. The, the VCs won't even touch that. If it's $100 million to get to market, then the VCs want to invest because they know the return is going to be in the billions, potentially, unless it crashes and burns, as most uh, Class three trials do. But healthcare is going to continue to take on investment, and maybe more so because I think there will be more entrepreneurs, as we discussed earlier, despite the regulation, will go into healthcare just to make a better life for people. Awesome. I love it. And I want to thank you for joining us. I, this has been beyond insightful. I think a lot of entrepreneurs are going to enjoy this because it is a field. And I always think of my fellow brothers and sisters in arms that are getting out of, the, you know, we have 275,000 active duty military leaving the military each year. And they're hoping at least 25% of those will become entrepreneurs, which will be awesome. Yeah. Here's an amazing new field. Uh, obviously, we mess in tech all the time in the military. That's a large part of our world now. Recently, completely non-tech related, but the Navy and the Army has started recruiting on Twitch, which is funny, huh. right? And video games, because everything is so virtual now. If you think about it, you know, drone Great. strikes are replacing our billion-dollar aircraft and live human yeah. beings. 
you could sit in the desert in 29 Palms, which nobody wants to be there, but you could sit in a bunker and fly a drone uh, in, and take do what we need to do to protect our freedom. So yeah. I, I'm hoping that they'll get out and drive it towards the medical field because that would be great to see some, some good investments. Uh, so your book, let's talk about before you go, what your book comes out in December, what's it going to be called and where will folks be able to find it when they do? Probably Amazon will be, I'll answer my own question. Amazon seems to own all the books in the world, but tell yeah. us. Yeah, well, it, it's called Innovation in Translation, um, How Big Ideas Really Happen. Love it's it. being published by Forbes. Nice. Uh, uh, Forbes didn't have any medical device entrepreneurs in their author portfolio, so they took a stab at me. Uh, so... Uh, it will be on Amazon. It'll, it'll, it'll be at Hudson News at the airports. Uh, Forbes is such a, a broad mm -hmm. platform. Um, but, yeah, my, my aim is to, you know, uh, start speaking engagement, start podcasts, and get the word out, and really become the educator. I mean, the book's great, but the book is just a tool. I need to get out there and begin a lecture and educate people on how to do this because it, 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 it's, it's not easy, but it's not terribly hard. If you understand the process, um, you can do it. And this is what the book will attempt to teach. Uh, but yeah, it'll be out there. So awesome. Well, I want to thank you again for joining us today. It's been great. Uh, everybody, if you want to get a hold of David, I'll have all the information. You can scroll below and look there on Facebook, on YouTube. You'll see it there. And of course, on C-Suite, it's right there in the description. You can just click it and it'll take you directly to contact. Find all the social information that you need to do. And uh, once the book comes out, we will add the link to it because we can always go back. That's the great thing about streaming things is you can add it in post-production long down the road. We'll have it in there so folks when it comes out. So David, we thank you so much. When your book comes out, we'd love to have you back on to talk about it and, and you know, talk thank about you. it. We'd love to have you on again. So thank you again for joining us. Everyone else, we'll be right back after these messages. Thank you for watching today's show. As always, if you'd like to be a guest or you know somebody that we should have on our show as a guest, feel free to email us at hello at tothepointtv.com. We look forward to hearing from you. And you can also email us if you have a complaint, want to give us kudos, high fives, or if you have an additional question for a guest, feel free to email us again at hello at tothepointtv.com. Our Twitter is up and running and it's for social good not yelling and screaming political or anything else crazy on our Twitter. So follow us on Twitter at to the point TV and we'll tweet back at you. And as always, we want you to check out our IG. We love Instagram. Our Instagram stories are up, they're buzzing and they're meant for you. We love our fans and followers and we want you to know who our guests are coming on and we want you to engage with us and we want to engage with you. So make sure you're following us at Instagram at to the point TV. Now, we love you on Facebook, and we want to make sure, because you're probably watching this on Facebook, like, why would I? You already follow us. But tell a friend that they can follow our show and never miss a live episode. As you know, here on Facebook, make sure you head, if you're not on Facebook watching this, then it's different, but our Facebook is to the point with Eric Mitchell. So make sure you follow us there so you always get notified when our show goes live at 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. Now, for the folks over on YouTube. Now, YouTube, we love our YouTube and our channel is growing and we love you there. Now, if you miss the live show at 12 p.m. Eastern, you can catch the premiere, which is re-recorded. <laughs> the premiere on YouTube goes down every day at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific, and simply just go do that. So remember, with YouTube, what we want you to do is smash that like button, hit the subscribe button, and flick that bell, that's right, hit the bell, give that bell some bell love, and that way you know when we're on air and you can catch our latest episode. Check out our playlist, all of them broker down by the day and guest and show, so you can always stay up to date. Once again, on behalf of the entire team here at To The Point, we wanna thank you for again tuning in and watching our show, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow on To The Point. As always, I am your host, Eric Mitchell. Be safe. Be strong, be smart, and God bless America. Let's get to the point with Eric Mitchell. Let's get to the get to the point. Sit and enjoy. This is Eric Mitchell. He the host of the show. Get to the point. He is the voice we needed. This something more.
This a daily show that's not for politics and the sports. Ain't no limit to whoever you may see at this point. To celebrities, every key's beast in the joint. As a veteran, put them at ease and annoying. Every conversation can never be disappointed. Whether tragic or it's happy, Eric will cover whatever's happening. Whether it be your gymnast toe tapping, talking about nearly any athlete, not taking a back seat. You're never gonna get a past T. Everybody running from it, it's a stampede. But he's on it like this man who took that knee. Mr. Mitchell's way too crafty.